Hello, hello, and welcome back to uh, Beatles Podcast, a bi-weekly show which is called Things We Said Today. On this show, we cover anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, possibly the future, their music, their history, their years together, their years apart. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three co-hosts of this show. Hopefully you know me for my syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing, as well as another Beatles podcast show that I'm a co-host for called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. That also is a bi-weekly show that airs uh, live on Facebook every other Monday night. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts. First of all, a man who has been in New York radio uh, for almost 40 years. He and I have careers in radio that are almost at the 40-year mark. And he's been at WFUV uh, all that time. And he's their Beatle guy. Does a lot of great interviews on the station and specials on the Beatles, including one he did a couple of years ago, a Christmas special for the for uh, mm. Beatle fans. And that's our own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello, everyone. How are you? And also we have Alan Cozen, who is the author of a couple of Beatle books, one called From the Cavern to the Rooftop, another one called Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And also he is working with Adrian Sinclair for a series of books on the solo career of Paul McCartney called The McCartney Legacy, the first volume of which won't be out till next year, but we look forward to that. And we're going to be drilling him on this show about everything that's in that book. Hmm. And that's uh, Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, Darren. And hello, everyone out there. A big thank you to all of our listeners who've been patient uh, due to uh, a family health emergency on my part. Also, uh, a health situation on Darren's part. We couldn't do a show for a few weeks, but we are back now. And we're going to do a show right now since this particular week, it is Paul McCartney's birthday. He's about to turn, believe it or not, 79 this coming Friday on June the 18th. I thought that we would just uh, mention our favorite solo McCartney songs and albums and our favorite McCartney Beatles songs. Uh, Three of each in that category, kind of like what I've been doing on my own YouTube channel. It sounds like the number nine dream show. We're also going to be doing a few of our least favorites as well to mix that in. Uh, But before we do that, as usual, we have uh, some Beatle news to get to. And the biggest news, of course, is the announcement of the archival release of George Harrison's classic, All Things Must Pass, which is now coming out August the 6th. There will be many configurations, like in all archival releases, including an Uber Deluxe box set, which will retail for $999. Along with that, there will be an 8LP Super Deluxe box set, a 5CD, one Blu-ray Super Deluxe set, a 5LP Deluxe, a 3CD Deluxe, a limited edition 3LP colored vinyl, a 3LP black vinyl, a two CD version, plus uh, All Things Must Pass will be available for streaming and for download. There'll be a new mix of the album from Grammy Award winning mixer and engineer Paul Hicks. And it's all overseen by Danny Harrison, who serves as executive producer. There'll be 70 tracks in total with 47 demo recordings, session outtakes and studio jams. It reads as though the songs that make up the two main albums of All Things Must Pass are remixes, but the Apple Jam sessions are strictly from the remasters. Of the five discs that make up the CDs, the first two contain the two main albums and the Apple Jam album. The third and fourth discs are made up of demos. Disc three is from May 26, 1970. Disc four from May 27th, and that disc is really what was bootlegged as Beware of Abco. uh, Between those two discs of demos, four of them were already released. Uh, It looks like on the Early Takes Volume 1 compilation. The fifth disc is made up of session outtakes and jams. Now, the limited Uber Deluxe Edition includes the album on eight LPs, plus the 5-CD Blu-ray version, 
housed in an artisan designed wooden crate, accompanied by two elegantly designed books, paying homage to Harrison's love for gardening and nature. We're not going to go into all the the uh, the knickknacks and the tchotchkes <laughs> that are part of the Uber Deluxe. We'll be here all day. And an article in Rolling Stone includes quotes from Danny Harrison, Klaus Vorman, and engineer Paul Hicks on all things must pass and the new box set, especially on the technical side of mixing the album. Interesting tidbit from Danny, who said that he and Paul Hicks wound up mixing so many tracks, the number given was 110 hmm. that Danny was hinting about future releases, but Danny wants to make sure that only the recordings of the highest quality come out. Boy, <laughs> that made some of us think that uh, maybe we might actually get an early takes volume two and three. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's 47 altogether that are beyond the, the actual All Things Was Passed album and the Apple Jam. And then you've got the remainder of that, that total 110. Very interesting. For the past month or so, we've been wondering about all things was passed, not hearing any official word, and wondering if COVID might even affect the Get Back release. It's now official that the book that's due to come out for Get Back is pushed back to October 12th. And while it hasn't been announced yet, the word I'm hearing is that the movie is still set for movie theaters for August 27th, but the box set could be pushed back to October. <laughs> This, at least to me, makes more sense since you wouldn't want All Things Must Pass and Get Back competing with each other for their box sets just a few weeks apart. But I'm not saying this is official. That's just the word that I'm hearing. And uh, it does make the most sense to me. Hey, you know, I don't know if you guys remember this. Darren, of course, was still in diapers. <laughs> but around the time that the original Get Back album was going to come out before it was renamed Let It Be. And when, you know, there were, it was still going to be, you know, the Glenn Johns mixes as far as anybody knew. Mm -hmm. They were talking about releasing it in a wooden box. I remember that pretty vividly. And I thought, well, I don't know, how's that going to, that's going to be expensive. How's that going to work out? But if we have two releases in a row in a thousand dollar wooden box, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to react to it, having ordered the Harrison one. <laughs> well, we are planning to do a show on the archival box set, so we'll definitely approach that subject when yeah. we get to it. Okay. And we won't discuss me wearing diapers. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Uh, more news. The BBC aired a documentary on TV in May called A Life in Ten Pictures for the number four, John Lennon. It tells the story of John's life through 10 very important and well-known photos of John from the only one taken with him and his mother, Julia, to John signing an autograph to his would-be killer, whose name he will not mention. Most impressive in this documentary are the people who discuss his life and these photos, including Mark Lewison, Hunter Davies, Bob Gruen, and Dan Richter. The documentary is currently on YouTube. Also, the newest issue of Goldmine magazine has John and Yoko on the front cover as they're doing a feature on the new Plastic Ono Band box set. In exclusive interviews, Klaus Foreman and other insiders talk about the making of the original album. The issue also reviews the new album from Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr., Blackbird, Lennon McCartney, Icons. News from the always excellent Beatles in Print Together and Solo Facebook page. A new book is coming out from photographer Harry Benson titled Paul. There will be a limited edition run of just 600 copies selling for 600 euros. That's approximately $750. And after that, there will be a trade edition. This is from Taschen Bookstore in Germany. Also, Jude Sutherland Kessler is continuing with her series of books on John Lennon. The latest, Volume 5, is titled Shades of Life, but the book is expected to be 1,400 pages long. So she's releasing Volume 5 in two parts, the first of which she's now taking orders for. 
Part one for Shades of Life will cover January 1st, 1965 through uh, mid-August of 65, when the boys leave the UK and get ready for their summer tour of the US. Part two will take it from there and takes you through the end of their 1966 US tour at Candlestick Park. If you're interested in purchasing part one, you can go to Jude's website, which is johnlennonseries.com. Some sad news to report on the passing of Bill Elliott from the band Splinter. This happened last week on Sunday night. The duo of Bill Elliott and Bob Purvis signed with George Harrison's Dark Horse label and released three albums for them, including 1974's The Place I Love, which George produced and played on for the entire album. In many ways, it sounded like a lost George Harrison album, and with many of George's closest friends playing on it, including Billy Preston, Gary Wright, Klaus Vorman, Willie Weeks, Jim Keltner, and Alvin Lee. Prior to this, Bill Elliott worked with John Lennon and sang lead vocals for the single on Apple called God Save Us, which was meant to raise money to save the underground magazine from the UK called Oz. John wrote the song, and there's a version that John sang lead to, which was released on the John Lennon Anthology box set and also the Imagine box set as well, with the title changed to God Save Oz. Bill Elliott's wife, Evie, said on Facebook that Bill had both a brain tumor and many complications while being in the hospital for four weeks, and he eventually had a heart attack as his immune system couldn't cope. And Bill had just released a new album called Never Went Back. So very sad to report on his passing. And I did not know. I didn't yeah. know he passed. Very sad news. Yeah. And uh, if you never heard at least that first Splinter album, all Beatle fans should check it out. Because mm -hmm. just like what we say about the McGear album sounding like a lost McCartney album, you could say the same thing about The Place I Love sounding like a Harrison album. Mm -hmm. They're really great songs all throughout. Uh, for those of you who are looking to get the new tribute album for Ram called Ram On, it is only available as an import CD at the moment, but this week, June 16th, we'll see its release digitally. Mark and Carol Lapidos have announced that, unfortunately, the Chicago Fest for Beatle fans is being canceled due to COVID. Next year, the Chicago Fest will be the weekend of August 12th through the 14th, and you will be able to make reservations beginning July the 12th. Now, that still leaves the New York, New Jersey Metro Fest up in the air, and that's scheduled for October 1st through the 3rd at the Hyatt Regency, Jersey on the Hudson. Let's hope that happens. A few reminders here. June the 24th, uh, another Lyndon McCartney cookbook is coming out, Lyndon McCartney Family Kitchen. June the 25th, Gabe Dixon will have a new album out called Lay It On Me. He was uh, one of the keyboardists on the Driving Rain album from Paul McCartney, and also played at the concert for New York. Also, Peter Asher is returning to the concert stage. He'll be touring in July and August with guitar great Albert Lee. And along with that, Kate Taylor, the sister of James Taylor, and bass guitar great Leland Sklar. Uh, you can look for a list of Peter's concert dates at his website. It's actually called, go to this website, Peter and Gordon, the singles, Dot com, A list of all the dates in July and August for Peter. Speaking of Peter, let's wish him a happy birthday as he turns 77 on June the 28th. And as we already mentioned, someone else named Paul is celebrating, is celebrating his 79th birthday this Friday, June 18th. And a reminder that the Fab Four Music Festival will be happening on July the 10th at Nolan Field in Ansonia, Connecticut. 10 Beatles tribute bands performing for the entire day. And there will be a special guest scheduled for this event. That being Brute Force. <laughs> Best known for the single King of Fa. We're trying to get Alan on stage to sing it with him. <laughs> I will be one of the MCs for that event. It runs from noon to 8 p.m., We'll also include Beatles memorabilia, great authors, area vendors, food trucks, and a variety of food options. For more information, you can visit their website, fab4musicfestival.com. 
That's fab with the number four, musicfestival.com. And that's it for Beatle News. Okay, so as I said before, our show today is all about Paul McCartney. We'll be looking back on his career and naming our favorites and a few least favorites of ours from Paul McCartney's career in terms of songs and albums. The categories that we'll be covering here are top three solo McCartney albums, and that includes Wings, The Fireman, whatever you like, top three solo songs, top three McCartney songs with the Beatles, and also one that qualifies as your least favorite in each of those categories. All right. So why don't we do, first of all, solo albums? And we're going to start with Mr. FUV, Darren DeVivo. Who? Who's that? Oh, that's you. (laughs) All right. Yeah, it's funny because when we decided to do this, I started brainstorming and thinking, you know, this isn't going to be another one of these instances that if we did the show again in a month, mm-hmm. my some of my picks would probably be different because it's so hard. I mean, we all love McCartney. That's why we're doing the show and all the folks listening. I mean, it's very difficult. Uh, but, you know, I tried to approach the things that I picked. Uh, and I have all kinds of scribbled notes here. I tried to approach it by picking the things that were near and dear to me mm-hmm. uh, and not necessarily worrying about what is, you know, considered the best or mm-hmm. got the best reviews or needs to be the most popular pick. Um, although in some instances, I think they sort of do correspond. But uh, these are solely what's near and dear to me. Um mm-hmm. So I'll start with uh, albums. And um, number one for me is uh, is Band on the Run. Now, that's uh, an obvious pick. That's an album that many folks think is McCartney's best. For me, Band on the Run is his best album. And it came out at a time when I was really, you know, growing up and learning and developing my tastes. For me, I have very vivid memories of... Helen Wheels being all over the radio. And again, these are some of the earliest, you know, memories for me. I was eight years old at the time. And, you know, these are the things that stick with you for your life, for your lifetime. You know, you remember your first time. And this was the period for me when I was really getting into McCartney and learning about McCartney and developing my taste for music. So, um, Band on the Run tops my my album list. And number two is Ram. In this instance, Ram was an album that I got into a a few years after, mid-70s. And I think that the amount that I really came to love the album came into its own uh, as I got older. Whereas Band on the Run was more immediate and close, not around the same time the album came out, but almost. Ram was a few years down the line that it clicked. Uh, how good that album was. Uh, and today, uh, it's kind of like, you know, my second favorite behind Band on the Run. The one here that would be uh, the, my album choice that would be uh, one that really is, I don't, like the, I don't like the expression guilty pleasure. But in this instance, it's an album that probably wouldn't get picked when somebody's trying to rank what they feel the best are. But one that is important to me is Red Rose Speedway. So basically, I've locked in uh, to that period in the early 70s, which was when, you know, I was growing up and developing my my tastes. Uh, Red Rose Speedway was my first McCartney album. Mm -hmm. And I think Band on the Run was second. And I had them both on cassette. And I still hear them when I listen to them today. I could be listening on the best stereo system possible, I still can close my eyes and go back to listening to those cassettes on my mono Zenith tape recorder that I had when I was eight, nine years old. In fact, I still remember my copy of Band on the Run was a defective tape that uh, in time wouldn't play anymore and would let off these crazy loud squeals as the mechanism was trying to turn And I can still hear in my head when I listen to Band on the Run, the defect on my cassette. But (laughs) the first one was Red Rose Speedway. 
the first McCartney album that I owned. And I had that album every sound and memorized. If you told me pick the three that I think are Paul's best, I wouldn't choose Red Rose Speedway. This is one that is, you know, I come to realize later on in life that it's, you know, for me, it's, I'm going to get teary eyed now. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like your first love, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So, so really there album wise, I'm locking into the early seventies, Ben on the run, Ram and Red Rose Speedway is my, my three favorite near and dear to my heart, McCartney albums. And you know what, when, when it comes to songs and I didn't do this intentionally, it's coming out of the same era for my three favorite uh songs okay um, we'll, we'll get to that oh you want to just stop here and uh yeah do albums for okay fine. yeah so there's my like, three albums band on the run ram and <laughs> what's it called <laughs> Red, uh, Red, Red Speedway. Rose Speedway. yeah so it's more of a, um, an emotional connection that you have yeah with these yeah, albums exactly. yeah uh, and 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 all of the albums i feel like you know, I'm, I, ha- I can put myself in, you know, I can I can I can picture myself where I heard even the albums that came out after that into the early 80s, where I bought them, when I got them, who got them for me, hearing them on the radio for the first time, seeing advertisements in newspapers. Uh, those are memories that are very important to me that tended to fade, you know, as I got older. And I guess life gets more complicated and more involved i don't have those vivid memories of the first time i heard flowers in the the day i went to buy press to play i don't have those those don't exist but i can still place myself in certain settings you know with the albums that i just mentioned getting them on you know as gifts christmas or birthday listening to them on my little tape recorder in my bedroom so this this is all those album picks were all you know from the heart. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious because you know we we've talked you know, every now and then about this, and it's it's a fascinating thing about all these box sets coming out because I think that it has generated more interest and more of an appreciation for uh, McCartney's catalog mm-hmm. when when they've all come out and in it especially. I've noticed the early McCartney, and I'm talking pre Ban on the Run. It isn't just Ram, you know. And and believe me, I've enjoyed this this reappraisal of Ram, which has been a gradual thing through the years. But I've noticed more people appreciating the first McCartney album, and now you know with with Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway coming out and box sets, more people seem to like it more and appreciate the simpler production, the pure organic sound of McCartney. Does any of that creep into why you feel the way you do, or is it strictly that was the start? I of don't, yeah, I don't think so because I, those three albums have always been, you know, my sometimes, you know, not, not to sound all sentimental and mushy and stuff, you know, those, handful of records songs albums whatever the case might be that you go to in those moments when you need you know you need a lift Mm -hmm. you know lack of a better way of putting it you know ben on the run and red rose speedway it's long before box sets were even something we would think about or before they even existed ram might have been a little later on but I would still think that that would be that that predated reissues and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I for some people, I'm sure it has an effect on their tastes. But for me, those for those three albums, that they were already long and in, ingrained in my being uh, long before the reissues. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that I do enjoy and and I don't think this has anything to to do. Maybe it does. The outtakes from Ram and Red Rose Speedway. I, I find myself more than any other album, any of the reissues, going to the outtakes and unreleased material uh, that came out of the the Ram and and Red Rose Speedway. Those outtakes tend to be my favorite outtakes. Uh, so maybe 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 in that instance, when it comes to the box sets of those two albums 
those are my favorite ones that I'll go to when I go for, you know, the, the discs that have the extra, the extras on them. If mm. that, makes, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alan, it's your turn. Okay. I have to sort of, you know, reiterate what Darren said about how, you know, if it was a different day, it might be different stuff. Um, like if we did this tomorrow, I might have three different choices. I approached it not as uh, really three favorites because there are so many more than three that it's, it's really just not fair to do. So um, it's kind of three favorites, but I tried to make it uh, with all of the, the categories a little bit offbeat, um, some predictable, some not predictable. I, I wanted, for instance, at, at a certain point to include the Russian album because I really love that album start to finish, but it's kind of not really a Paul McCartney album in a way. I mean, it is, but I think of a Paul McCartney album as an album with material written by Paul McCartney, which this didn't, that didn't have too much of, you know, any. Uh, yeah. It was, it was, uh, glitched for a second to the um, 1999 one, Run Devil Run, which at least had a few, right? along with the oldies. Um, and also the Firemen, I could have, you know, it, it was tempted for a second to pick all three Firemen <laughs> records because I uh, really like that stuff. But I wanted to do things that were more conventional Paul McCartney albums, if you know what I mean. So the top one for me was Flowers, uh, Flowers in the Dirt. I can't say that I necessarily love every track on it. And in fact, one of the tracks, which I've mentioned many times in this, in this uh, uh, sense uh, on the show, <laughs> uh, is among my least favorites. But we'll get to that. But nevertheless, you know, it has the start of the collaboration with Elvis Costello, which I thought was extremely promising and kind of wish they had continued because, you know, I, I, I love them both. I think that there's a certain acerbic aspect to Elvis that is a little bit Lennon-esque, you know. I mean, he's not John, but uh, but he has... I think you can detect an awful lot of the influence of John, you know, not just musically, but in sort of approach to life <laughs> and everything. And 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 I I kind of thought if anyone could get Paul to focus more on lyrics or leave the lyrics to him or whatever, it would be Elvis. Um, and the songs of, that are collaborations on Flowers are all great, and most of Paul's own songs on flowers I really like as well. The second one is one that I don't think gets nearly as much respect as it ought to. And that's Back to the Egg, the last Wings oh. album. Lawrence Juber is an excellent guitarist, perhaps the best guitarist that Paul has ever worked with. And that's, you know, nothing against the two in his current band, who I also think are, are great guitarists. But uh, Lawrence Juber comes to it with, you know, classical training, jazz, uh, you know, the, that guitar solo at the beginning of uh, Baby's Request is just fantastic for that song. And, um, you know, all through the album. And that configuration of bands with Juber and Steve Holly, I thought, played extremely well together. But I also really like the material on the album. I don't know why people don't seem to warm up to it, but I really just pretty much love everything on it. And, uh, you know, it's possible that, you know, Darren was talking about, um, you know, where these things came out in his lifetime um, and how it affected him sort of personally. I guess for me with Back to the Egg, it's also the fact that the the video version of, of most of Back to the Egg came out as well. And I, I, I really liked those. I, I think they helped give me a kind of perspective on the songs at the time, um, so that they weren't. It wasn't just an album. It was an album with a completely video component, um, which you know everyone thought would be the way of the future and hasn't really been. But it worked really well for that album. But there's just a lot of great stuff on it. Uh, a lot of different textures, arrow through me, and you know it, it's it just. Uh, 
very varied and not experimental, but you can see Paul sort of stretching out. And I think a bit of that has to do with the constitution of the band and, you know, what he knew that these guys could do. Uh, so Back to the Egg is my second one. And my third one is McCartney 3, which, you know, may seem too recent to have the perspective that we have on all the other albums, which we've lived with for years, and that one we've lived with for only a few months. And then the sort of imagined version of it uh, we've lived with for a few, a few fewer months. But, um, you know, they, they kept the songs in our ear for a while. But I just, uh, you know, that album has stayed with me uh, longer than, say, Egypt Station, longer than a number of, of the others. It just seems to work. So I, I think that uh, as time goes by, I think we'll see that as, as a particularly strong album. No matter what you want to say about his voice, no matter what you want to say about anything else, there's just some really great stuff on it. And again, start to finish it, it plays very well. And uh, I think he's, you know, despite what I've said about being inspired by the band makeup for Back to the Egg, uh, he also does pretty well when he's just on his own. So, uh, and, and, and this is, is great proof of it. Uh, probably more than either of the, you know, McCartney 2 or McCartney, this one, I think has the, the best consistency. So those are my three albums. Very interesting, Alan. I wanted to Great just pick. ask you about uh, Back to the Egg. Do hmm. you think that um, Paul was just trying to, he only partially did it, um, reflect on the punk rock of the time? Do you think he fit well with songs like Spin It On and Old Siam, Sir? Those songs? Yes, yeah, spin, spin It On, definitely. Yeah, also, I am sure I can see that too. I hadn't really thought of that as uh, as part of his response to punk, but now that you mention it, yeah, I can see that. But but spin it on. I, I love spin it on. I, I I really like when he gets that kind of energy going. And uh, if it was a comment on punk or a reaction to punk, um, you know, it, it it very probably was. And uh, you know, I think he showed, you know, as as he quite often does, that a style comes along, he can embrace it and make it completely his own. Mm. That's certainly true. He's he's Mr. Versatile. He can adapt to just about anything. OK, my uh, three choices. I, I do want to just repeat by saying that our opinions can change over time. And especially when you're dealing with a catalog as massive as Paul's there's so much music he's given us. And, uh, I can't tell you how often certain albums that I've liked in the past. I like a lot more now than I ever have. Nothing ever diminishes in my eyes. They only get better through time. But, um, my top three would be my number three album would be flaming pie mainly because I think, uh, I love all the songs on this album with the exception of really love you which I think is really a throwaway. It's more like a spontaneous jam between Paul and Ringo. And that in and of itself is a cool thing to do. I just don't think as a composition, you know, it's really uh, a great work of art, but it's still enjoyable to listen to. And when the songs are good, they're really good. Uh, you know, The World Tonight's one of my favorite songs of his. And Some Days is an absolutely exquisite ballad as is Calico Skies. I like the collaboration with his son, uh, James, on Heaven on a Sunday. Uh, the R&B feel of uh, Souvenir, uh, the songs we were singing, very heartfelt there. Going back to his, the early days with John, writing songs together. Beautiful Night, I'm glad he brought that back. You know, it's uh, Calico Skies is wonderful. There's so many powerful songs there that I think represent some of the best uh, of McCartney on one album that I would definitely put Flaming Pie there. You know, I, I should also say that, you know, very often I'll, I'll rate albums like on a scale of one to 10, 10 being a great album. And whenever I go through McCartney's catalog, there are about 11 or 12 at this point that I would consider to be a 10. 
So it's very hard for me to just narrow it down to these three, but it's a combination of them being great and being favorites. Songs that really pack a punch with me, songs that I connect on, songs that when they're really good, they're especially strong. The second album is one that you've heard me talk about many times on this show, and that's Press to Play. I love Press to Play a lot because I like every single song on it. I love the production on it, despite the fact that a lot of people connect it with the 80s, having an 80s sound, heavy drums, synthesizers. I don't mind that sound at all. And since I'm someone that still plays that music anyway, not just Press to Play, but a lot of 80s music, it doesn't sound dated to me. It sounds very fresh to me. One of the songs on Press to Play is actually in my top three favorite McCartney songs. But I love the whole sound of it. I love the experimental nature of Talk More Talk and uh, Pretty Little Head in particular. I think Stranglehold is a great album opener. Good Times Come and Feel the Sun is a fantastic medley. Um, mm-hmm. And Footprints and Only Love Remains, two killer ballads back to back. Press has got amazing hooks throughout. I love the whole arrangement of it. Move Over Busker is more traditional rocker, uh, traditional rocker from Paul. I like Angry a lot. It's a disappointment only because of who the personnel is and what you could have done with Angry. But still, I enjoy the song and it's got a great edge to it. And however absurd is very beatly, very melodic. I love the sound of Paul's voice. And I don't know how much you want to get into bonus material because, you know, I listened to the CD uh, when it came out. And those three bonus cuts are fantastic, especially Tough on a Tightrope. And I really especially love... Uh, the songwriting between Paul and Eric Stewart and wish that they had done more. But, um, you know, we all know uh, about the problems with Press to Play later on. Anyway, we heard about how Eric Stewart was originally going to be the producer and then Hugh Padgham took over. And between Eric and Hugh, they both were disappointed with the final outcome. But I've always loved that album and I love it more and more as the years go on. And, um, It's been a solid number two for quite a while for me. My number one album is actually the same one that Alan picked, and that's Flowers in the Dirt. I've always Mm. loved Flowers in the Dirt since the very beginning. My Brave Face is a killer opening song and a fantastic uh, single, which should have been a bigger hit. I love the whole sound of it. The only problem I've ever had with this album is that it lacks a rocker. And even though Figure of Eight is a good rock song and it was a great song to open his tour with. I love the version that came out as a single, which had more of a live feel to it than the studio version that's, that's on flowers in the dirt, which is kind of tepid by comparison, but I still love the song. Uh, you know, it's got some of the best songs of McCartney's solo career on there. This one is a perfect, absolutely perfect pop song. Everything about it is great. The verses, the bridge, it just flows like like perfect wine. <laughs> you know, I just think of it it's like it's like a Penny Lane type song in that regard. You know, I love the collaborations with Elvis Costello too. Just like with Eric Stewart, I wish he had done more with with Elvis. And yes, like Alan said, he brought that that acerbic edge in the lyrics. You can kind of tell sometimes if the lyrics come from Elvis. I love the dark nature that he brings to the songs, especially That Day Is Done, which is one of my favorites of McCartney in a solo career, has a real gospel feel to it. I love We Got Married and the the jazzy feel of that song. Um, I like You Want Her Too as a duet, although it's very similar to the same approach as The Girl Is Mine, same concept, but they really sound great together on there. Really, everything about it, Distractions, is a masterpiece. And uh, it really has a a nice, light jazz feel to it, which I think really works uh, for that song. Don't Be Careless, Love is another. It's a real odd one. (laughs) And uh, you you can definitely tell an Elvis Costello influence because melodically, it doesn't go necessarily where you think it would go, but yet it still makes sense. And for McCartney to start, a song that way with just vocals in a high register. I love that about that particular song, uh, really challenging himself vocally. I love Motor of Love. 
It's got a real Beach Boys feel to it. Goes on a little bit too long, but I still love it. And I do love it ending with Oué Le Soleil. It's a great dance track, which although there's only a few lines in it, you know, there's a lot of great dance songs that are like that, like The Hustle, for example, hmm. which, uh, you know, is what comes to mind. So, yeah, overall, Flowers in the Dirt would be my number one. If I ever had to grab a McCartney CD to take with me in the car, I am always in the mood to listen to Flowers in the Dirt. It's the one that I always think of first. Um, so those would be my top three. Okay. Um, why don't we... Why don't we Great picks, both of you. Oh, oh, thank you. Why don't we move around here and why don't we do the Beatles songs, Paul's Beatles songs next? Your top three favorite Paul McCartney Beatles songs. We'll start okay. this time with Alan. Mix it up a bit. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, back to the idea of choosing, um, you know, not necessarily the expected ones, like, for instance, yesterday, you know, you can't in a way realistically not include yesterday among your top three McCartney songs, but I didn't just because it's too predictable. So I went to the track just before it on the British Help album, which is I've Just Seen a Face. I've Just Seen a Face, I think gets overlooked on the British Help album stuck in the middle of side two as it is um but we all grew up with it as the opening track on rubber soul and it was great opening track i think we've talked about that before so i i won't keep going on about that but it's also a really good song i love the guitar riff that it's based around uh the the finger picking and um you know, it's got a, a, a really good feel, a good sound, um, and it's, uh, you know, the lyrics aren't bad either. Uh, so I'm choosing that one just because I, I feel I, I could be wrong, of course, but I feel absolutely sure that nobody else would, and it deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> the second one, and these are in no particular order, mine. They're, they're not necessarily one, two, three. They're just the order on the list is All My Lovin'. That one may be in the predictable category like yesterday, but um, I don't know. I just think it's uh, one of his best early songs. Would have gone maybe with uh, I Saw Her Standing There, which is probably one of his best really early songs. This is slightly later. And I think it's a, a bit more of a mature song than that. Uh, but apart from just liking the song and his vocal on it and the whole arrangement, his bass line just knocks me out. Um, it's, you know, this is where he is moving from, you know, sort of standard bass line type bass lines. I mean, even the bass line for I Saw Her Standing There, it moves and it's really good, but it's also basically the bass line from I'm Talking About You, Chuck Berry's song, um, which I think he's admitted. All My Lovin', you know, it, it basically is a line of counterpoint within the whole texture. And I, I have always just loved that. Uh, and my third one, I mean, I don't know, it was sort of tempted to do here, there and everywhere. But it, that's like yesterday. It seems too obvious. So um, I went with Penny Lane just because Penny Lane and it's flip side strawberry fields were sort of the beginning of the pepper uh, sessions. And you could see already Paul is trying to do something new. You can see it, especially if you listen to the outtakes and the uh, anthology take where, you know, he's sort of overlaying pianos. He's creating a sound that, you know, the, the finished record sounds nothing like those early stages. And so you just sort of wonder whether he had the finished vision in mind or whether it just grew into that um, and whichever it was, it doesn't really matter, but it's got, I think a, a really lovely lyric, a beautiful melody and just the arrangement of it, you know, shows the Beatles sort of entering into that next phase of theirs. So those are my three McCartney Beatles tracks. Hmm. All great picks. I don't know how you, you decide these things. I mean, it's like, I, I saw her standing there versus all my loving. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, 
Jesus, you can go either way with so many songs. It's it's impossible. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, and certainly, obviously, we we love all those songs. But all my love, and there's something about how it starts with just that vocal, mm-hmm. and it sucks you right in, you know. And the tremolo Some guitar figure, like the tremolo guitar but, figure, also creates kind of a vibe for that song, you know, beyond the bass line. So yeah, it's it's, it's great. Yeah. You know, I think I might have said this before, but sometimes people mention all my loving is having a country and western feel. And and growing up as a kid, to me, it was just a rock song, mm-hmm. all in out rock. But yeah, when you think about it, that twangy sound in there, it does kind of fit in a country and western uh, kind of vibe to it. So yeah, uh, Darren, how about you? All right. Well, what I did with um, my Beatle picks here. I picked one song, which is a showcase of McCartney, the songwriter, perhaps my favorite song in that kind of subcategory, composer. I picked one, which is definitely my favorite track when it comes to him showing off and showcasing his bass playing. And I picked a third tune uh, around Paul, the vocalist. Uh, I'll go with vocalist first. I've always felt McCartney's one of the greatest rock singers ever. And Helter Skelter is that I still crank it when that comes on and I'm in the car. And uh, I pity the person who's in the car with me at the time because they're going to get it. You know, they're going to get pinned to the back seat when that when that comes on. This is McCartney's vocals off the charts on Helter Skelter. And this is the same guy who sang yesterday and here, there and everywhere. And many, many years later would do things like my love and you know but here he is helter skelter and to me he holds his own with the great rock singers the robert plants the rod stewart's the paul rogers just names popped into my head randomly Mm -hmm. so that would be one of my three favorite Beatles songs focusing on paul specifically as vocalist helter skelter for paul mccartney the bass player with the beatles i went with rain i mean that's it's a lead instrument uh, the bass on Rain. And, and, and Alan mentioned, uh, I saw her standing there, even though it's a bit of a copy. That's another one of my favorite McCartney bass parts. Uh, but Rain, always been one of my favorites. I think it's one of the greatest B-sides ever. Uh, and, and one of a handful of singles that the Beatles released that could qualify as uh, one of the great singles ever. I think that that's one of, you know, Rain with Paperback Rider amongst the great singles ever released. And the Beatles have a few of them that I think go in that category. Strawberry Feels Forever and Penny Lane is another one. Maybe the best concept single ever released. Uh, So a third, um, and these aren't in any particular order. We got Helter Skelter focusing on Paul the vocalist. Rain focusing on Paul the bassist. Paul the composer. You Never Give Me Your Money from Abbey Road is, um, you know, and, and this was the type of writing that Paul would do more of uh, in his uh, solo career, almost like mini suites, mini, uh, yeah, suites. That's what I'm thinking about. Mini suites of different pieces, all perfectly linking together. Uh, you Never Give Me Your Money has always been right up there as one of my favorite tracks on Abbey Road, which is my favorite album of all time. So um, those are my three uh, Paul picks with the Beatles songs, Helter Skelter, Rain, and You Never Give Me Your Money. Okay, very interesting choices. I should point out that we didn't really uh, lay any ground rules here uh, when we did this. Uh, You know, when I think of McCartney Beatles songs, I'm thinking of songs that he wrote or songs Mm -hmm. that he sang lead to. So, you know, I was kind of surprised that you put Rain in there. But, you know, I I was... I wasn't going to pick it because John sang it. It is more of a John song. But, I mean, for decades now, every time I hear Rain, my ear goes right to the bass. Mm. Oh, you know, and Ringo's, it's also, I think, one of Ringo's shining moments on drums. But uh, when Rain comes on, I immediately go to McCartney's bass, listening to that. Uh, and that's been the case for me for as long as I can remember. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Um, my choices, except for maybe the first one that I'm going to mention, 
are fairly predictable when it comes to uh, McCartney's Beatles songs. If there's a song that's really popular and it was a huge hit or something, I, I'm not the least bit embarrassed to admit that I love it, even if it's something that that is predictable. Although you won't think that when it comes to Paul Solo stuff, <laughs> but when it comes to uh, the choices for for what I for what I chose for Paul Solo uh, songs, but with the Beatles, I did choose "She's Leaving Home." Oh, "She's right. Leaving Home" is a gorgeous piece of work, and I think it never gets the credit that it deserves. I love the orchestration behind it. I love the harp that's used in the song. I love the melody. I think Paul has a real rich quality in his vocals that I don't hear that often, but it's certainly right there on She's Leaving Home. And um, it's also important to point out that John played a big part in that song because he wrote the counter melody, the We Gave Her Most of Our Lives part. So it's not entirely a McCartney composition. It's mainly a McCartney composition, but John's contribution was very important to that song and i just think the whole arrangement there was just wonderful even though paul couldn't wait for george martin to score it (laughs) you know he was in a hurry to record that song and george martin was not available he had another session to do for number two i picked the long and winding road which is one of my favorite songs of all time from anybody i just think it's a gorgeous song And maybe a lot of it still has to do with the fact that it came out at the very end of the Beatles' careers, and it serves as an epitaph, kind of like the end does. You know, McCartney, at the end of the Beatles as a group, even though the Let It Be album was recorded before Abbey Road, since Let It Be was the last that was released, to end the Beatles' group career with both Let It Be and The Long and Winding Road, two absolute classic tunes is just pretty remarkable to me. And I love the whole song of The Long and Winding Road. I love Melancholy Paul. Maybe that's why I put She's Leaving Home in there. It's like, I like sad songs. It's got, you know, when I think of She's Leaving Home, I also think of someone like Brian Wilson, who's so great at melancholy music. <laughs> um, Long and Winding Road, despite what's said about Phil Spector's production and uh, Richard Hewson's arrangement, I love it. It's the version I grew up on. I like every version of The Long and Winding Road, but I think it really worked in this particular case. And I know some people are going to, you know, argue this point. It will be a never ending debate, you know, that it's drenched in the Phil Spector sound and Paul didn't like it. Well, you know, when Paul performs it live, it's not too far removed from the version that Phil Spector produced. So um, I love everything about The Long and Winding Road, and I'm proud of that. I think it's just... uh, from start to finish, a wonderful song and a wonderful recording. And my number one choice is the most predictable choice, although it's not yesterday. I had to go with Hey Jude. It's just um, a great song overall. Some of Paul's best vocals, Paul's best screaming on the coda. I love how long the coda lasts. You know, despite the fact that it's over seven minutes long, I've never felt that it's too long. And uh, everything about it, the melody, the way the band played it, very simple in its arrangement, but um, it's such an outstanding song. Maybe a lot of it has to do with the fact that it was the Beatles' biggest hit in the United States, number one for nine weeks, and that that's something that sticks out in my mind every time I hear it. But um, it's such it's a masterpiece, you know, and uh, it's such a, a great uh, crowd pleaser. And Paul does it live as you would expect it to. You know, I can't praise a song like that enough or any of these songs that I mentioned. All right. So I don't want to end this show on a sour note. (laughs) So why don't we do our least favorites before we finish with our favorite solo McCartney songs? And we're supposed to pick one for each. And we'll start with Darren for least favorite solo album first. Okay, and I won't get into much detail because it's the least favorite. Now, this was how I I, I was trying to explain it before we recorded the show uh, to Ken that, you know, even an artist that something's got to sink to the bottom. Uh, And even if it's a favorite artist, you could love all of the albums by a particular artist. Something has to drop to the bottom of the list. That doesn't mean it's bad. You don't like it or whatever the case might be. 
so I thought that that would sort of help would put things into perspective with the things that we really liked if we compared it to things that don't move us as much. So my um, album that would fall to the bottom of the barrel for me for McCartney would be Give My Regards to Broad Street. And I mean, a lot of it's re-recorded material. It's a movie soundtrack. If I wanted to take that out of the equation for those reasons, I think the album that I, then I would go to would be Pipes of Peace. But number one for me down there, least favorite uh, would be Give My Regards to Broad Street. There's stuff on there that's very near and dear to my heart in there. And you were just talking about the long and winding road, Ken. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of like that, that uh, somebody once referred to it as Lionel Richie version of the long and winding road that's on Give My Regards to Broad Street. I kind of like that one. And I like that scene in the movie. As for least favorite song from the post Beatles period, that one was pretty hard for me to pick. Uh, and the one song that keeps popping into my head, uh, although I don't necessarily know if it, maybe there's a couple of other tunes I might like least. Is that proper English? Uh, I'm going to pick Gratitude uh, from Memory Almost Full, which to me, I really don't like Gratitude. And for me, it's really drags what could have been a nearly perfect album, Memory Almost Full, uh, pulls it down for me. And Beatles, be honest with you, I couldn't do it. I really couldn't find something that, you know, and, I, and, and I'm going to get people going to go throw knives at me when I say that maybe this classic all time masterpiece is a song that just I don't that doesn't never did much for me. And that's yesterday. I acknowledge its place. I understand why it's held in such high esteem. I get it. Just for some reason, it just didn't never really resonated with me. And part of it could be overexposure, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, but I couldn't really seriously find a good pick for me for the least category when it came to Beatles songs. For solo stuff, wing stuff, the post Beatle period, gratitude is, is right, is, is there kind of right amongst maybe a handful of others, a very small group of others. And for album, uh, it's always been give my regards to Broad Street just because there's very little going on on that album. Okay, Alan, what are we going to do about Darren? Well, you, you know something. <laughs> something tells me that he's mentioned his feeling about yesterday before. Yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, right. yeah. I, and it's... I, I totally understand. You know, there's. An, I am not knocking yesterday whatsoever. <laughs> I've always felt an, another another one in the same same type of uh, issue, same type topic is everybody. I know a lot of people hold tug of war very high, very highly in the re a lot of people will pick that as amongst McCartney's best albums. And that's down near the bottom of the barrel for me as well. Hmm. But I understand all the, high, you know, the uh, high points of, of uh, tug of war and why it's thought of so highly for some reason it i just didn't connect with it and for some reason for me yesterday's never really you know moved me like it has a lot of other people but i understand its place in history mm. darren i could understand where you're coming from because i think with a lot of artists there are certain songs that get cited as being their best and maybe get played the most and i think you know when all is said and done despite all of the great songs that Paul McCartney has written and recorded yesterday may end up being his signature song. And he does deserve a lot of credit as does George Martin for the arrangement and to have that beautiful melody and, and wonderful sentiment set to a string quartet, which was so unique for its time, a very haunting melody. So I understand the appeal of that song, but there are certain songs and a lot of artists catalog that get played to death. Oddly enough, I don't hear yesterday that much these days but um yeah. i can understand why why you feel the way you do but i still think it's a a stunning piece of work i will say one quick thing though i have always felt that there are other ballads that mccartney wrote 
that are better than yesterday that I don't understand why either they weren't hits or maybe aren't uh, talked about more often when you're talking about uh, McCartney, you know, masterpieces. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, That I'll say, and I feel like he's written better songs than yesterday. Oh, I agree. But there are, you know, there's something about there's intangibles uh, in there as well. You know, the time that it came out that all add up to making it almost the perfect song. But again, it just doesn't totally click for me, but that's fine. Sometimes the groundbreaking aspect of it is it gives it so much more weight and importance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I understand that. Alan, uh, how about you? Okay. You know, if we if we all agreed, it would be really boring. I mean, as a show. Right. So. um, Mm -hmm. So I'm doing my bit and (laughs) listing press to play as my least favorite um, of McCartney's solo LPs. But, you know, like with my most favorite ones, that changes all the time. I mean, sometimes I listen to Press to Play and I think, oh, you know, it's not so bad. But with Press to Play, I think, you know, what my issue with it always has been is that it was a really promising album. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of songs begin like the like Press, for instance, begins really well. It begins like, oh, this is going to be a really tight, tough song. And then the vocal comes in, you know, darling, I love you very, very much, you know, uh, and uh, really, I mean, I mean, apart from starting a song by say, oh, counting, um, I, I can't think of anything, you know, less creative than that. And this is a very creative guy. So why is he doing that? It, it, it just bothers me. Um, and, you know, I don't really <laughs> like 80s music that much. And so that probably is why I like pre- don't like Press to Play and, and Ken does. I mean, for, for all the reasons Ken said he liked it, were all the reasons that I sort of put it at the bottom of the list. You want to guess my least favorite song? It might be tough. There's quite a few I've mentioned. No, <laughs> I don't think I need to. Okay. <laughs> it's got to be Uwe Le Soleil. Of course. Yes. But it could be <laughs> Wonderful <laughs> Christmas Time. But... Anyway, Uwe Le Soleil, probably, you know, I, I, I am hoping that it never gets worse than that. And, you know, but again, even that, there have been times when I've listened to it and I thought, you know, it really does have a groove. It's kind of, you know, I understand. Yeah. I understand what he's doing here. I just don't like that kind of thing. So I don't like that kind of thing, no matter who does it. And he's doing you it know- here. So. But you know what's interesting about you you not liking that? Hmm. Earlier in the show, you spoke very highly about the fireman stuff. Now, right. it's different type of dance music, but it does kind of come from that same mindset. Hmm. Uh, that and, and it's interesting that you would dislike Uwe Le Soleil so much, but you do like the fireman albums. That may be interesting. I'll have to think about that. Um, the Fireman albums, to me, sound more experimental and electronic and strange timbres and strange structures. And Uwe Le Soleil, to me, just sounds like a repetitive riff that just goes on and on and on. Um, okay. And yet, you know, people who know me in my classical guys would say... Well, why are you expect? Why are you, you know, upset about a track that just keeps repeating on and on and on when you're a big proponent of minimalism, which to many people in the classical world just keeps repeating on and on and on. So, you know, we think we 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 hear the way we hear and 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 respond in um, you know whatever emotional slash intellectual slash who knows what ways, and and things seem different to each of us. So um, Uwe Le Soleil is for me. And in order to, to, keep, um, to keep the contrarian aspect of this alive, yeah, like, with, like Darren said, it, it's extremely difficult to find a McCartney Beatles song that you would put at the bottom of the list. Um, but for me, I guess it has to be Long and Winding Road. 
<laughs> Sorry, Ken. And here's why. It's not so much the specter arrangement, although I think that kind of ruins it. I understand that his tour arrangement is similar, although in, I think, the one that he did in um, Broad Street, he used uh, winds and reeds yeah. instead of strings. Uh, you know, it, it, it does change. Um, but I, I did hear Long and Winding Road first before the Spectre one came out because the Glenn John's acetate was bootlegged. It was played on WNEW FM in, you know, sometime in 1969. And so we all taped it and we all listened to it until the Let It Be album came out. And so when it came out, it was kind of a disappointment because the band only version to me sounded a lot better. But even so, to me, it was kind of a sort of a draggy song, you know, like I, I just couldn't really totally warm up to it. Not totally sure why, you know, and, and again, like I say, it's all of the Beatles tracks. Uh, it, it's hard to, to really say that you dislike one of them or dislike, you know, I don't know if I dislike Long and Winding Road. It, it's just that if I were putting together a Beatles compilation with, you know, all but one of their songs, that's probably the one I'd leave off. Hmm. Okay. I don't even know if it's that's kind of true. interesting. You, <laughs> there, there's two choices there that made up favorites of mine that you put as your least favorite. And then <laughs> we both agree on flowers in the dirt though. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> let me start by saying, first of all, when, when Darren proposed that we do least favorites, I'm kind of reluctant to do that because we did our show on our least favorite Beatles songs. And even though we kept stressing that we're not saying that we hate these songs, I think some fans interpret it that way. And I've always said that Beatles songs go from good to great. You know, I don't really think that there's a clunker in the bunch, really. But um, for me to pick my least favorite Paul Beatles song, the only thing that I can think of would be a song that's not really a complete song or, you know, one that I take seriously, something like Wild Honey Pie, you know, and yet I'd rather have it on the White Album than not have it, mm -hmm. you know. My least favorite Beatles songs, I still like, and I'm glad that they're out there. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I can't put Her Majesty in the same category as the rest of the Paul songs in the Beatle catalog. So if I have to pick anything from the Beatles, that would be it. I mean, I like all the other ones, all in varying degrees, but um, by no means are we saying that we, we hate any of these songs, although some people will, will still hear that in their heads. But um, And when it comes to the solo music, truthfully, those songs go from good to great as well. There's only a few clunkers for me anyway. So um, it is very surprising, though. I'm, I'm wondering if Darren's listening to my other shows. <laughs> <laughs> because I've been saying that Gratitude is my least favorite solo McCartney song. So mm -hmm. out of, you know, how many hundreds of songs has Paul done in his solo career for us to pick the exact same one? I, I'm just really surprised. It's, but and for some reason, that song, when Memory Almost Full first came out uh -huh. and I was getting to know the album almost immediately, that song was like, nails on the blackboard for me and mm. i don't know why because he's done other tunes that i've been like uh, uh paul really gratitude something about grat makes me mad yeah it, it's it's really <laughs> for me it's an irritating song it and really that's is an album memory almost full is an album if we ever did a show like we did underrated i would say memory almost full is an album that is amongst his best mm. except Gratitude really pulls it down for me. Anyway, continue. Yeah. Yeah. You know, usually with all the solo music of the Beatles, after a handful of listens, the songs stick with me. No matter how many times I hear Gratitude, I never remember how it goes. I just know that it bothers me. And I don't like the way that he says gratitude, you know, throughout yeah. the song. And uh, I don't know. I like when Paul tries to do something more, more of an R&B vein like Souvenir, like Call Me Back Again, those songs, but not Gratitude. That's, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, that would be my pick for a uh, song. And as far as least favorite album, 
again, the, the albums go from good to great. So I don't regret ever having bought any solo Beatle album. But ironically, like you, Darren, my pick would be Give My Regards to Broad Street. And um, I'm saying that knowing full well that I love the two new rockers. I love No Values and Not Such a Bad Boy. I think uh, No More Lonely Nights was a fantastic ballad and a great it choice is. as a single. I love Dave Gilmore's lead guitar work on there. Um, and I even love um, uh, the instrumental that was used that was actually a bonus track on the CD of Goodnight Lonely Princess. Right. As far as the Beatles stuff, it's, it's kind of tough to, to top what's already been great already. It's one thing when Paul goes in concert and does these songs and you're enjoying it from the live aspect of hearing him do it. But it's very, it's, it's practically impossible to improve on what were great recordings to begin with. So um, I still like when he does something different, like for no one, when he does that on acoustic guitar, instead of it being a piano based song. I like that a lot. I love the version of the Long and Winding Road in there very much. Kind of like what you said, uh, you know, Lionel Richie-esque. Hmm. It's very adult contemporary with the sax playing in there. I like every version of the Long and Winding Road. It's just that if you were to compare the version that was the hit with the Phil Spector production with the bare recording of the Beatles, regardless of what you might think, if you prefer it bare that way, it never would have been a hit that way. No way at all. It needed dressing. It needed orchestration. Maybe you think Phil Spector's production was overdone uh, or the arrangement from Richard Houston, but it needed something. It couldn't survive like that as just a band recording and be a hit. No way, at least in my opinion anyway. But um, yeah, with Broad Street, I do like most of it, but it's not one that I go to that often unless I'm going to hear the new songs. Yeah, it's just the way that I feel. I do like what he did with Eleanor Rigby going into Eleanor's dream. I thought that was really brilliant, especially where it's placed in the movie with the scene with Paul and Linda and Ringo and Barbara and the rowboat. You know, I love all that stuff, but it's it's just not consistently all the way through what I feel like listening to. I would cherry pick certain tracks from here. So even still, an album that I like the least there's a lot of worthy tracks on here that I'm still going to pull from anyway. So, um, did I cover everything? I mm -hmm. think I did. <laughs> no one picked wild. All right. Well, you know, I, I like, I like wildlife. I, I like every song on wildlife. Yeah. I like bip bop the least, but, I, but I still like hearing everything else on the album. Interesting. Because I mean, a lot of people, including Paul, sometimes, uh, singles out wildlife is, you know the, the I don't know about worse, but yeah, I mean, it, Paul has um, has said negative things about wildlife, um, based I think largely on the general perception of it. Mm -hmm. I've uh, you know while working on the book, I've come to sort of respect it a bit more than I always had before, um, because you know we were focusing on every track and how it was made and and uh, what went into the songwriting and all that, and the you know side two has some great stuff. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, it, I, I think it uh, it stands up better than I had expected it to. So I was just sort of interested that you, neither of you chose that either. In fact, you, you both chose the same same album. OK, I've always I've always liked the album. It's just that I like other albums better. Hmm. But um, for a lo fi album, <laughs> you know, starting a band out, what a daring move to start that way with very unpolished songs, <laughs> Right. you know, but, uh, yeah, like you said, side two, uh, I love tomorrow tomorrow. I think if I put together any McCartney compilation, you got to have tomorrow on there. Mm -hmm. I think some people never know sounds better now than it ever has. And the mm -hmm. harmonies are amazing on that song. Mm -hmm. And I always loved love is strange. So mm -hmm. if you want screaming vocals, mumbo is pretty darn good mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I do like wildlife a lot. Why don't we uh, now move on to your favorite solo McCartney songs? Okay, and let's let's start with um, Darren this time. Okie dokie. Uh, my songs actually kind of mirror, in a way, the albums that we started the show off with, uh, the favorite uh, solo Wings albums. One of my three albums was... Red Rose Speedway, one of my three songs 
is Little Lamb Dragonfly for very much similar reasons that I picked um, You Never Give Me Your Money in the Beatles song category. Little mini symphonies. Not, that's not a good description. They're like little mini suites, both of those songs. And that's, I think, McCartney's, when it comes to con- composing music, that's McCartney's strength. And that he probably could write a hit song in his sleep. But these little suites that he could come up with of these interlocking, finding songs that, little snippets of songs that he just makes them fit together seamlessly. Mm-hmm. Uh, little Lamb Dragonfly has always been a song that captivated me from the days when I would listen to Red Rose Speedway on that little mono Zenith cassette recorder, tape recorder that I had that uh, I would play my handful of pre-recorded cassettes on. So Little Lamb Dragonfly, uh, one song. And here, again, not straying far, one of my albums was Band on the Run. My next song is No Words. Mm. No Words is just, uh, I wouldn't say it's a power pop song, but I mean, another, the vocals, Denny and Paul together, makes me, Really feel like Denny was such a, an underrated force in Wings, and I really would have liked more people to have a, appreciated, uh, you know, his contributions to the band. When you start getting into discussions like, should Wings go into Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Well, they weren't really a band. It was Paul's backing band. That's yeah, not totally accurate, uh, but you know, whatever. You know, Denny Lane had. Uh, some really significant contributions to offer and no words is one of his shining moments on that one Mm. from band on the run uh finding getting to whittle it down to a a third one was very hard i wanted to go completely left field and the song that suddenly popped in my head when i was making my lists out earlier flying to my home Mm. Uh, wow b-side flying to my home and oh woman oh why two b-sides that i kind of put in those categories of really good rock and mccartney tunes that no one knows except us mccartney maniacs and on a safer side i was thinking do i pick flying to my home do i pick a woman oh why do i play it safe for my third song and go with junior's farm which is one of my favorite uh of paul's rockers and one of my favorite hit songs of Paul's. So I decided what I would do is combine them. Oh, woman, (laughs) I'm flying to Junior's farm. So I'll mush those three together as my third pick, only because uh, I wasted more time trying to separate them and pick one of them. So there you go. Those are my favorite right now. We do this show again next year for Paul's 80th birthday, and I'm probably going to be picking different songs. I think Little Lamb Dragonfly, though, would be definitely there because that's been one of my favorites forever. It's funny that you mentioned Flying to My Home because I always thought it did have a Ram feel to it. Hmm. Yeah, and the vocal, um, the vocal, both A Woman, A Why and Flying to My Home, sort of um, tough vocals, but Paul singing also in a, in a voice that he doesn't, that he didn't use on any other song, both of those. Hmm. Um I always thought that flying to my home, well, yeah, it may stick out a little bit, uh, would have worked on fl- flowers in the dirt, but. Uh, okay. Anyway. Yeah. All right, Alan. It's up okay. to you. Okay. My first one is Backseat to My Car from Ram. I just love that track. Okay. It's, uh, you know, it's a little mini, I don't know, symphony, little mini opera in a way. I mean, you've got characters of, you know, the two kids who want to get away go driving maybe down to Mexico, got the parents, you know, they're not really singing characters, but they're there, they're present, you know, sort of warning them to behave themselves. It's uh, like Darren said, with some of the other things, it's really one of his sort of suites, you know, made of a number of fragments of things that really fall together very well because he made the lyric, you know, follow through from section to section. Um, And it's also, you know, it's just a a beautiful tune. Denny Sywell and uh, Hugh McCracken was on that one. 
you know, do a, a spectacular job. I mean, Hugh's guitar playing, uh, if you listen very closely to the little fills that go on here and there, uh, great stuff. Uh, and, and also George Martin's orchestration, just a great song. And, you know, as uh, we we were talking, I think uh, we never actually did the show, but we were talking a, a couple of months ago about a show about great closing tracks for albums. I mean, there you go. Backseat in my car. Mm. Can't do better. My second one is My Brave Face. Uh, for me, one of the highlights of Flowers and Flowers itself is a highlight. So, and, uh, you know, again, it's, uh, it's, it, it tells an interesting story and, uh, Kind of like I said with my pick of Back to the Egg, it has that video component. I think it's I think it's one of his best promo videos, partly because it has all that Beatles memorabilia in it. So um, you know I'm, I'm bound to like that, uh, but also the little sort of story of of the stuff getting stolen, which has nothing to do with the song. You know, but I like the imagery of, you know, uh, taking dirty dishes and just throwing them away, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's, it's a, a, a great little portrait of, of someone whose relationship is broken up and, you know, he's there trying to work it out and the music is incredible too. And it's one of those Elvis McCartney collaborations. So it has everything going for it. And the third one kind of tough because there are so many things and uh, you know it just occurred to me when Darren was talking about flying to my home the b-side of my brave face and the voice that uh, he uses in that I, I, for some reason it put me in mind of so bad which is another overlooked track that I think is really just a, a gorgeous melody but it wasn't my pick my pick was I've had enough you don't hear that so well. You don't hear any of them so much because radio doesn't play this kind of thing anymore. But uh, you know, it's um, it's a really sort of you know nice tough track, um, kind of like you know, I, I equate it with "Spin It On" on uh, "Back to the Egg," but it's obviously earlier, uh, and um, it just uh, it it just has a, a great feel. Again, it also I believe it also has a, a really good video too. But um, I think about that less with this song than with some others. But it just is. It's, you know, we we've been talking about McCartney as a rocker, and I've had enough. Has a lot of that. I just like the sentiment too, because like, who hasn't had enough? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Excellent choices there. And I have to uh, tell you that, you know, I've always loved Backseat of My Car, but these days I really recognize it as being one of the absolute best from a solo career. I mean, everything about it, especially, you know, the production is so wonderful. I've been meaning to ask you something, Alan, since you've been doing a lot of, uh, you know, research for your book, but George Martin had a lot to do with Ram. He did a lot of the scoring. He did the scoring for uh, Uncle Albert, Albert Halsey, Backseat of My Car. There's some scoring on Long Haired Lady. It, you know, is there any reason why his name wasn't included when the album came out? Um, I don't know, but, you know, I found that to be the case on a lot of McCartney albums where people don't get credit for things, especially arrangers. I mean, do you see Tony Visconti listed on Band on hmm. the Run? Right. And uh, I'm not sure that, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. It may be, you know, given that it's often arrangers who, who don't get listed. I, I wonder if Paul feels that or, um, orchestration and arranging is sort of like an ancillary job and that the real songwriting is what he does. And they're just sort of, um, you know, tarting it up a bit. You know, and I, I really don't know, it, you know, because he he specifically wants arrangements for certain songs. He goes to people and hires them to do it. Why he doesn't credit them, I, I, I just don't know. Mm-hmm. And you would think, considering the name that George Martin is in Paul's history, you know, he'd be more than proud to put his name there. On the album. You might but, think that, but during the Ram period, he was also trying to get away from the whole Beatle thing. So maybe that true. played into it. Mm. Okay. All right. So uh, let's get to my top three. 
Um, for a long time now, I've I've had the same top two for quite a while, probably for I don't know a couple decades at least. That hasn't changed. And number three could be so many different songs, but I wanted to pick a single. And even though there's so many great singles that Paul's put out in his solo career, and I do look at Uncle Albert as being a masterpiece. I love Another Day so much. I love Band on the Run so much. So much work put into so many of his singles. I just think Junior's Farm is one of the greatest rockers of his career. I just think there's a coolness factor with that particular song. The whole arrangement of it, the sound of his voice, uh, the way that it ends with him taking a breath. (laughs) And uh, also Jimmy McCulloch's great guitar solo. It's just a solid rocker all the way throughout. And I kind of wish, you know, Paul, Paul in recent years has been doing the song. I know that when he started the, uh, the Wings Over the World tour in Australia, he was doing Junior's Farm, and I think it didn't work out well enough for him so that when he came over to America, he wasn't doing it. And, you know, when it comes to rockers, it seems like in concert, Jet gets all the attention. But I wish Junior's Farm would get as much attention as jet because i think it's it's really a, a standout rocker throughout his career and i love the way it was produced and the sound of paul's voice and everything about it so that's what i uh picked as my number three my number two is my favorite love song in paul's solo career and that would be only love remains and i just think that everything about that song is so perfect the sound of paul's voice where he's hitting that high note in the in the uh I guess it's the bridge of the song. Um, it's just, uh, it was arranged so well. Uh, I love everything about it. I love the sentiment of the song. I love the lyrics of the song. The melody is fantastic. You know, he's done so many great love songs in his career. It's, it's sometimes hard to pick which one is the best, and we all have our favorites. But, um, you know, uh, and don't get me wrong. I think My Love was a great song and it was a huge hit, number one song. But he's he's done so many other great love songs that deserve attention. Only Love Remains was a hit on the adult contemporary charts in America. But I think uh, the average fan out there that doesn't fully study McCartney doesn't even know that song. And it's a shame. You know, uh, I just think it's it's a perfect song from start to finish. And my number one song has been that way for a long time, and I never get tired of hearing it, and it's 1985. And you talk about a song that's a perfect album closer. You couldn't have picked a better song to end Ben on the Run with. I love the the whole keyboard part. It's so damn catchy. Um, Everything about it, the whole arrangement and how it ended bringing back Ben on the Run. You know, there are just certain songs that really work well as album closers and also standing by itself as a separate song. You know, that could have been a hit all by itself. So many other songs from Band on the Run could have been hits as far as I'm concerned. But I really think that, you know, Paul thankfully started doing this song in in the last decade. But it ranks right up there with the great piano songs of his career, like Lady Madonna. And, um, yeah, I, I never tired of hearing 1985. Anytime it's on the radio, which isn't that often, I blast. <laughs> I blast the speakers. Yeah, so that would be my top three. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Our list of favorites and uh, a few least favorites from Paul. And uh, I hope our listeners liked our picks. So before we go, let's go around the horn here and give our listeners our contact information and what we're doing at the moment. Darren, why don't you start? All right. Uh, you could send me an email uh, at Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Obviously, that's my WFUV email address. I have two Facebook pages. Please uh, join me at one or both of them. Uh, send me a friend request. Uh, don't be... Uh, thrown that i will respond by asking how you know me just simply say you're a listener because i try to get a feel for everyone i'm connected to uh and darren devivo is my main page there's also another one which you could click like or follow whatever facebook is calling it now darren devivo wfuv dj 
I don't remember the name of it. Beetle podcast host, something like that. You'll find it. Or if you send me, send me a friend request, I'll invite you to the other page and catch me on WFUV Monday through Thursday nights, uh, 10 p.m. At the moment, the show ends at midnight. Normally, pre-pandemic, I was on till 2 a.m. Monday through Thursday nights. Uh, some technical uh, issue with remote broadcasting that uh, forces my show to end at midnight, 10 p.m. Monday through Thursday nights and Saturday afternoons, 1 to 4 p.m. If you're in New- the New York City metropolitan area, we're at 90.7 FM or uh, or you could listen one or two people that still listen to HD radio. We have uh, 90.7 FM HD2 or anywhere on the globe. Stream us at WFUV.org or download our app and listen on the interestingly titled WFUV app. I'm kidding. It's like, what else would we call it, right? <laughs> so uh, you could listen on the app, and there you go. And soon we'll be putting implants. Anyway, <laughs> so that's my spiel. All right, very good, sir. Alan, it's your turn. Okay, you can find me on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And you can contact all of us by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed, which is at Things We Said Fab. We have two, count them, two Facebook pages. Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans, and just plain old Things We Said Today. We should have Things We Said Today remix, shouldn't we? Anyway, the shows get posted on both of those. Uh, You can also find them on Podbean and on iTunes and on YouTube. And if you listen to them on YouTube, please remember to subscribe to us. All right. Very good. Uh, as for me, you can email me at everylittlething at att.net. I do have a Facebook page for Ken Michaels. You can friend me on there. Um, as far as my other work, um, on my YouTube channel called Ken Michaels Radio, I just recently did an interview with our very own Alan Cozen. And we talked about something that we discussed a bit when we had the White Album Symposium on the 50th anniversary of the release of the White Album, which is what uh, we feel, or you know, certainly what Alan feels, was the Beatles' creative peak. So we discussed that, and he also talks a bit about the uh, upcoming series that he's been working on with Adrian Sinclair called The McCartney Legacy. That's a Ken Michaels radio. It's a whole bunch of relatively new interviews that you can find on there. One with Joe Mayo, who's my co-host on uh, on Talk More Talk. We do a new concept called the Fab Five, in which I ask my guests to uh, name five albums, one Beatle album, one from each of the solo Beatles that are your go-to albums for today. Not necessarily what you think are the best albums from each, or your favorite albums, just which ones you feel like hearing right now. If you had to pick one, what would it be? So we talk about that on my YouTube channel. Again, it's Ken Michaels Radio. Please subscribe to that if you can. And um, also, don't forget my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com, where there will be weekly Beatles trivia every single week. And you can always win one of 10 fantastic prizes, be they books, CDs, or DVDs. And one more thing, I have my syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing. And I just finished the show in which uh, I have a Father's Day set that I play in there. And that's when a Beatle, uh, it's a, their songs from the Beatles group and solo catalog that connect a Beatle with either his father or one of his kids. So, uh, and they'll be more than one set coming (laughs) uh there'll be more in other shows of every little thing something right there and also depending upon which radio station you listen to you might be hearing a mccartney special for his birthday there's a one-hour special that i produced as well so that's at kenmichaelsradio.com and i do believe that's everything so this has been fantastic talking about our favorites and a few least favorites from paul mccartney's incredible career And, of course, we wish Sir Paul a very happy 79th birthday this Friday. Thanks for all the great music and all the amazing memories and history he's given us. And here's to many more. 
And so for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening. And we will see you next time. Happy birthday, Paul. Happy birthday, Paul.